I'm Pam Popper from Wellness Farm Health in Columbus, Ohio. So I just had to drive a very short distance to be here. How many of you have never heard me speak before? Five. Most of you. That's always good when it's a new audience because then I don't have to do so much making up new talks. It's you know? <laughs> easier for me. Um, all right, so uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what we do because it bears on what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes here. Our practice specialty is in informed and medical decision making. And I teach through analogy, so the easiest way to explain what this is is to help people understand that the way that you should buy diet, health, and medical information is the same way you buy cars, houses, blenders, washing machines, retirement accounts, and college educations for your kids. You may not be in those businesses, but you manage to make pretty good decisions because you ask questions, you do research, you consider your options, and you choose the best choice for you. Everybody do that every day when you do other kinds of buying decisions. Right, okay. And so I'm 62 years old, and having done that my whole adult life, I look back on most of the decisions that, they, that I made that way, and they're pretty good. I made pretty good decisions. A couple I would do differently, but for the most part. All right, now you contrast that with the way that we buy healthcare. We go into a doctor's office, the doctor says, do this, and we go, okay, no questions, right? And so what this leads to is people sitting in my office saying, if I'd known then what I know now, I never would have, and then you can fill in the blank. I wouldn't have had the screening test I wouldn't have done the paleo diet like my neighbor told me. I wouldn't have taken this drug or had this procedure or done any number of things that people do in the areas of diet, health, and medicine. So our stance is that you need to know now instead of later, and unless there's an emergency, at which point reading my book and eating a baked potato is not going to help you too much, what you really want to do is check into things before you take action. And nobody disagrees that that's a reasonable thing to do. The problem is now how do you do it? And that's what we're in business to do, is to help people actually accomplish that. So we're going to apply, and, okay, oh, it is working. Okay, we're gonna apply all of this informed decision making to a topic called diet, exercise, and mental health. And so I wanna start by telling you how I got interested in the mental health business. It's when I started realizing that um, most of the people, or many of the people, I should say, who were coming to see us about who had chronic degenerative conditions like diabetes and cancer and heart disease, also were suffering from depression, anxiety, um, all kinds of um, psychological disorders, and, and they never got better. I've noticed that they never got better. And I started thinking to myself, what if mental health is like cardiology? And there's some Dr. Esselstyn of mental health out there who's found the secret to helping people with their psychological issues and nobody knows about it. And that's exactly what I found out. And through that whole discovery process, I met my business partner in the mental health business, Dr. Peter Bregan, one of the most exceptional people I've ever met in my life. He's a psychiatrist in Ithaca, New York, who in 50 some years of practice has never prescribed a drug and never institutionalized a patient, ever, which is remarkable. So, I called Dr. Bregan and invited him to speak at our conference in couple, well, 2012. And he was clearly not a plant eater at that point in time. He clearly hated all of the food. He actually ordered steak and eggs in the restaurant when he was having breakfast with my father. And my dad said, I don't think you really got through to him on the food. He said, no, I'm really not why he's here right now. But anyway, uh, we became good friends and eventually business partners. And we're developing, um, we have developed and are continuing to develop a very robust mental health program at our, at our company that I'll tell you a little bit more about later. Um, now, the end of the story is last year, um, Dr. Bregan spent a week with us filming videos for um, this one course that we are offering right now, and he fell in love with the food at our office, because I do have Chef Dell, who wrote the books of a nice cookbook, and uh, if you can't fall in love with the food with Dell, you're not, never going to happen. So, now he is Peter Bregan, 30 pounds lighter, off all of his drugs. Thank you, Chef Dell. Who um, has me as a regular guest on his radio show and refers patients? He talks to all of his patients now about diet, um, but for reasons that you'll understand soon, because it really does have a profound effect on, on mental health. His wife, he talks about this all this time. His wife um, had ulcerative colitis, had past tense, and uh, is off her drugs, lost a bunch of weight, and the two of them are like teenagers again. He's 82, 83 and she's in her mid-60s, and they work like 22 hours a day. And he's probably writing a book while I'm delivering this talk, because that's how productive they are. So anyhow, we have a you know, plant-based psychiatrist. You don't normally hear those terms in the same sentence, but yeah, he's, that's where he is now. So um, let's go on ahead and, and talk about mental health. And 
the first thing is, I don't know how many of you are aware, but there's not a single study that has ever shown that there's a chemical imbalance in the brain that causes any psychological disorder, ranging from attention deficit disorder to psychosis. And one of the problems is there's really no way to measure serotonin levels in the brain unless we grind up your brain and assay the material. We don't recommend it for obvious reasons. And in fact, this whole chemical imbalance in the brain thing was based on a study that was done on rats that appeared to be depressed. I don't know how you determine that a rat is depressed, but apparently these researchers knew how to do it. And they did grind up the material on autopsy in the brain, and they noticed that the serotonin levels were low, and that was the birth of the drugging people for psychological disorders movement. But according to English psychiatrist David Healy, indeed no abnormality of serotonin and depression has ever been demonstrated. So the psychiatry profession is becoming um, more and more intact uh, about this whole thing and being asked to explain itself for obvious reasons. And Ronald Pies, who's a psychiatry professor at Tufts University, at one time was the um, editor, the former editor of the Psychiatric <laughs> Times. Um, and here is what he has said about the chemical imbalance theory. He said, in this is a quote, in truth, the chemical imbalance notion was always a kind of urban legend, never a theory seriously propounded by well-informed psychiatrists. Really. Then he goes on to say, when pressed further, my impression is that most psychiatrists who use this expression feel uncomfortable and a little embarrassed when they do so. It's kind of a bumper sticker phrase that saves time and allows the physician to write out that prescription while feeling that the patient has been educated. And then when pressed further, he finally said, well, maybe it was a little white lie. I mean, just unbelievable. Now, this little white lie has led to the drugging of an enormous number of Americans. One in six adults in the United States is currently taking one of these drugs. 84.3% of people who take the drugs use them in the long term. In other words, this is not something that uh, people do for a few weeks or months until they get themselves back on track. An analysis, and this was just published, an analysis of 522 trials, not a small number, involving 21 antidepressant drugs and over 116,000 patients so to show that the drugs are barely better than placebo, okay? While the public was told that the drugs have improved the life of mental health patients today, right now, today, every single day in the United States of America, 850 adults and 250 children are placed on disability as a result of taking the drugs. This is a mental health problem and a drug problem that is far bigger than the opiate drug problem. And that is a big problem. So where, where did this all come from? Well, the first thing is we have a lot of disease monitoring going on. Um, the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual, which is the psychiatry bible of diagnostic diseases you can diagnose and get reimbursed for treating, keeps expanding. And as at one time it was 30 diseases, now it's almost 300. And recent additions include caffeine withdrawal, that's now a psychiatric disorder. We can justify drugging you for it. Central sleep apnea, hoarding disorder, cognitive decline, premenstrual syndrome, that qualifies for psychiatric treatment, restless leg syndrome, and social communication disorder. Now what this means is as this book has gotten bigger and bigger and the list is bigger and bigger, the chance that you will be diagnosed with some type of psychiatric disorder if you hang out with doctors long enough is 50%. 50% of all Americans. So, all doctors today can prescribe the drugs, and many of them do. Um, family practice, OB-GYN, internists, rheumatologists. And here's what I think happens. Now we're gonna get into the part that involves diet and that sort of thing. I think that a lot of people who are poorly fed, dehydrated, don't exercise, and don't get any sunlight, show up at a doctor's office and they start, you know, doctor says, how are you doing? I'm tired, I don't feel good, I don't really have any get up and go. I'm not really going out much anymore because the symptoms of bad nutrition and being sedentary are kind of similar to the symptoms of depression. And a doctor during a seven to 10 minute visit says, gosh, I'm sorry you're feeling so bad. How about some Zoloft? And that's the beginning of drugging people. Almost any negative thought that people have for even a fleeting moment today is a reason to drug people. It's considered pathology. And uh, the treatment is always drugs. There is really no viable alternative offered by the traditional medical community at this point in time. Now here's one of the big problems. Drug withdrawal is difficult. Uh, people do not have a chemical imbalance in the brain when they start taking these drugs, but they quickly develop chemical imbalances in the brain as the brain tries to adapt to the drug and function differently. Withdrawal can produce 
very dangerous symptoms. Um, the brain can be slow to recover from all the damage that's been done, so judgment and self-control can be impaired. Severe depression, mania, psychosis, violence, and suicide can occur. And then the original problems, if there actually were any, at the time that the person was drugged, start to resurface, and nobody really knows what to do about them either. So we have prescribers who are really good at putting people on the drugs, and then we have very few people who know how to take people off the drugs. We do have a program for that now. But um, it's very difficult to find people to go along with it. I remember being in a family practice doctor's office with one of our members not too long ago who really wanted to be helpful, and he said, one of my biggest concerns is that withdrawal from the drugs is difficult. People often have severe problems. Your psychiatrist is likely to refuse to see you if you tell him or her that you're going to withdraw. And there's a three-month waiting list to get in to see another psychiatrist. And if you crash, I can't help you. So um, that's what people face. So what we found is that a team approach works. In fact, Peter Bregan wrote a book about a team approach to psychiatric drug withdrawal. So you need a team. And then the other thing, and this was my idea when we started talking, and I was hoping we could come up with evidence, but I'm so excited to share with you that we have it. I thought, you know what, if, if, you're, doing, if you're withdrawing from psychiatric drugs and it's really demanding physically, I mean, it plays games with your head too, but it's really demanding physically, I would bet, you know, let's see if we can test the theory here, that if you took care of yourself, you started eating right, you started exercising, you took off some weight, you drank enough water, maybe this wouldn't be quite as miserable. It's going to be difficult no matter what you do, but maybe it wouldn't be so bad. Well, I started looking for evidence, and um, I could not believe how much I found. And it goes back years and years and years. So it was a German scientist who said, one is what one eats. Everybody agree with that? Yeah. And the use of food to address psychological disorders goes back thousands of years. In fact, traditional Ayurveda and Chinese medicine both use plants as a way of addressing psychological disorders. And by the way, I don't call it mental illness. We do not believe in mental illness at our office. And in fact, Tom Saws, a psychiatrist um, who died just a few years ago, wrote a great book called The Myth of Mental Illness, where he basically said a lot of wonderful things, but he said people who are called mentally ill don't do anything different than we do. They just do it to a different degree. And so who, do, who gets to decide what is the fine line that you've crossed that you now get labeled mentally ill? Some people think I'm mentally ill because I speak out about things that are unpopular to talk about. So, and maybe I am. I spoke recently, I, some of you get my video clips, um, I found this uh, article uh, that uh, they're thinking about having a new disease now called compulsive gaming disorder. People who can't put down their phones and play with their phones all the time, games on their phone. And so I thought, I think I have compulsive research disorder. <laughs> and, and it's defined as, I even came up with a definition for it, it's defined as the inability to pull oneself away from medical journals to the extent that you avoid spending time with friends and family and people want to work with them. And I definitely have it. And after I said that, people sent um, all kinds of condolences and hoping that they get yeah, So we had, good, we had a good time with it on YouTube. This one guy said his prescription was three green smoothies a day. He said, if nothing else, it'll make you go in the kitchen and use the blender and you'll be away from your computer during that period of time. So lots of suggestions on how I could overcome the disorder. Um, along this line of, of, the, of the diet, though, back to the diet having something to do with this, if you take a look around the world, um, the places where people eat healthier diets, you have much less disease, much less incidence of depression, psychosis, and anxiety. Now that's observational, and it doesn't really tell us that there's a cause and effect relationship, so we have to dig a little further. And when I started doing this, this is when I started getting really excited, because I found articles that were very specific in their recommendation of a plant-based diet or verbiage to that effect. So for example, a study of over a thousand women Women eating a traditional diet, vegetables, fruit, meat, fish, whole grains, have lower risk of major depression and anxiety. The risk increased for women who were eating a Western diet, fried foods, refined grains, sugar, and beer. And what you'll see in these studies is several of them show a dose-dependent effect. In other words, the better the diet is, the less depression you get. The worse the diet is, the more depression you get. So when you see that dose-dependent relationship, we get very excited about that. Um, a study of almost 3,500 middle-aged people regarding diet and depression. A whole food diet, vegetables, fruit, and fish, versus a processed food diet. Participants at the highest quintile of whole food eating have lower risk of depression. And they actually use the term whole food eating. Okay, so, so this, there's nothing nebulous about this. 
Um, I want to make sure I'm doing that. Yeah, I'm on the right page here. Um, now, this is an interesting study. Data from a cohort of, um, of civil servants in the UK concluded that poor diet is a risk factor for depression in women. The healthier the diet, the lower the risk. Okay, so again, that dose-dependent um, finding. A study of over 1,100 adults uh, with low education and income levels, diet quality significantly associated with symptoms of depression. Studies looking at overall dietary pattern. I was excited to find this. This was a meta-analysis. It basically said if you look at the studies on diet and depression, the ones that show the most, um, the, the highest correlation are the ones where it's the entire dietary pattern. In other words, when people start thinking about doing something other than drugs for depression, they start thinking about St. John's wort and supplements and all that sort of thing. Well, if it's not a biological problem to begin with, I don't think using a different biological substance is the key. And in fact, we don't get very good results when you really look at the outcomes for, for supplements and that sort of thing. The action is with the diet. That's where you really find the benefit. Study of 97 adults with mood disorders, consistent association between more nutrient-dense foods and better health, better mental health. And, and I'm going to read you this quote. This detailed analysis in a clinically diagnosed sample was consistent with prior epidemiologic surveys revealing an association between higher intakes of nutrient, higher levels of nutrient intakes and better mental health. Um, another thing we see is in studies of um, patients who have diseases where there's high incidence of depression, like diabetics are notoriously depressed, and you would be depressed too if you were diabetic. It's not much fun being in that situation shows that a diet with more vegetables, leafy greens, fruit cooked whole grains, and whole grain bread was protective against depression and type 2 diabetes, and then the opposite is true. The more of the refined foods, the processed foods, the junk that people ate, the worse it got. Um, here's another study of adults in Iran, which is a pretty depressing place to be these days, but nonetheless, lacto-vegetarian diets were associated with a lower risk of depression in women, when people ate the opposite, higher risk of depression, and then this is a quote. Sometimes the, the conclusions are so impactful, I have to read them to you. Recommendation to increase the intake of fruits, citrus fruits, vegetables, tomato, and low-fat dairy products, and to reduce the intakes of snacks, high-fat dairy products, chocolate, carbonated drinks, sweets, and desserts might be associated with lower chance of psychological disorders. So in, in kind of, I was hoping I'd find a few. I'm sharing with you a few of the dozens and dozens I found. All right? Um, a study of Seventh-day Adventists showed the same thing. Vegetarians had significantly less negative emotions. And then, this is what's interesting. Vegetarians also have a lower intake of omega-3 fatty acids and DHA and a lot of things that are supposed to be important for brain health. And this is a quote from the study. These, these results challenge what is known about the link between dietary fats and brain function and suggest an unrecognized benefit of vegetarian diets, which are naturally low in the long chain of omega-3 fats. So sometimes we, we don't even need to worry about supplements in that regard, too. Now we're going to. Uh, okay, I saved myself. All right, this is good. <laughs> me and technology. When something breaks at the office, people tell me to leave the building. <laughs> you could go work at home for a while and then come back. That's the kind of thing that they say to me. No respect I get there. But, but they're right about it. I'm just amazed when anything even works. Right? So. Okay, so 39 were omnivores who are randomly assigned to three diets, and control diet, just keep eating the same thing, a diet including fish three to four times a week, but avoiding meat and poultry, and then a diet that avoided the animal foods altogether, and the conclusion was restricting meat, fish, and poultry did the best job of helping people feel better, right? Um, those with, and here's what, the, the, what I thought was really interesting about this. Those, assigned to, those who were randomly assigned to the vegetarian diet who were the most anxious at the beginning and the most tired at the beginning showed the greatest improvement. So it's almost like the worse off you are, the better the help you're going to get from doing this. Um, and the authors also noted, I thought this was interesting, that high intake of arachidonic acid, which is concentrated in animal foods, causes changes in the brain that can negatively affect food, uh, affect mood. So again, reasons to eat the diet we're learning about here. Um, a study in Puerto Rico, two groups, non -veg vegetarian and non-vegetarian, pretty clear. The non-vegetarian group had a lot more anxiety and depression. And so it goes on. And here's one I found that actually involved a vegan diet. Um, the vegan diet resulted in improvement in depression, anxiety, and productivity. A study of vegetarians, vegans, and omnivores. Increasing restriction of animal food, and that means conversion from vegetarian to vegan. 
is associated with approved mood. So all, all along the spectrum, you go from eating not much plants to more plants, to eating vegetarian diet, to eating vegan diet, you see improvement all along the way. Again, that dose-dependent response that tells us that something is really going on here. Um, the same thing was found in adolescence. We have an epidemic of depression and anxiety in adolescence. I wouldn't want to be a kid right now. I think it's much harder than when I grew up. So I understand that. But a study of over 3,000 kids between the age of 11 and 18, those that had the most, uh, the worst dietary pattern had the most emotional problems. Um, subjects with good diet at baseline had developed psychological issues as their diet quality decreased, whereas the opposite was true as well. Um, and of course, the healthy diet is fruits and vegetables, but not without so much junk food. Even when they don't convert to a perfect diet, like what you're learning about here, you still see improvement. Um, data from almost 3,000 ethnically diverse adolescents showed a, a connection between diet and mental health. Um, and again, you see the highest quintile versus the lowest quintile. You see the most, uh, the most difference in mental health. So that does depend on effect again. And to a certain extent, this is just slide after slide after the same thing. And I guess the reason why I put so many of these in here, I know it sometimes gets boring to hear the same thing again and again, but I didn't know how else to impress upon you the number of studies. And this is a fraction of what I have archived on my server. This is not you know, an incidental, gosh, thank God Pam could find one study that shows this. This is like study after study. Um, case control studies of girls 12 to 18, consumption of ramen noodles, hamburger, pizza, fried food, I mean, all the stuff kids love to eat, associated with worse depression. Intake of green vegetables, fruit, and fiber improves depression. Random sample of over 5,000 kids in China, same thing. You look at three dietary patterns, the kids eat the most plants are the most mentally healthy. And then here's a cross-sectional study of a group of kids in New Zealand eating a healthier diet associated with better emotional health. Um, prospective cohort study of over 23,000 women and their children. Women who eat well during pregnancy, their children have better mental health, and if they eat well after the child's born, the child has even better emotional health. Um, I have, by the way, I have like 10 hours of stuff like this, so I'm giving you a fraction of it. When you get into the mechanism of how this works, it is incredibly fascinating. I think every woman should read this stuff before, um, before getting pregnant ultimately would be the best. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about, because it's directly related to this, is the gut microbiome and mental health. Because what you eat affects your gut microbiome, and your gut microbiome affects your thinking process, believe it or not. Those microbes down there are not only very plentiful, but they're very smart. So there are 100,000 times more microbes in your gut than there are people on the Earth. In your gut, one gut, than there are people on the Earth. I want you to think about that. This is a very large colony of critters down there, all right? Um, Actually, there are, your, your bacteria have more genes than you, your whole body, all right? So there's more of them than there are of us. Your microbiome is like your fingerprint. Everybody in this room has a different one. There are no two exactly alike. Because of what we now know about the gut microbiome, it's become um, part of the medical practice of anything. I don't think you can be in a medical practice of any type without dealing. I mean, doctors manage to do it all day long, but they should not be ignoring the gut microbiome. So if, you're, if there are negative changes in your gut microbiome, you're gonna see negative changes that affect all aspects of health, ranging from inflammatory bowel disease to psychological conditions. So, um, how do we get our microbiomes? Well, we get some of it in the placenta. There are 300 types of bacteria in there. Vaginal birth is how a baby gets a lot of it, and we have the highest incidence of C-section birth in the world. That's not so good. Some of it's necessary, most of it's not. Um, babies who are C-section birth to get their bacteria from the hospital environment, not the best way, as you know. And then breastfeeding is better than formula feeding in terms of acquiring bacteria. So this micro uh, colony in your gut, um, the bacteria talk to each other, by the way, and then they talk to the brain, and the brain talks to the bacteria, and they have all this crosstalk going on. And they're so intelligent. These creatures used to live outside of our bodies, and at some point in time, they decided it was easier to live inside the, um, the bodies of other beings. Even ants have a microbiome, believe it or not. Um, it's much smaller than ours, obviously, but they have one. And, uh, and so basically what happened is when the critters moved inside, they became renters in our guts. And we made an agreement with them, and it went something like this. Okay, you get to live down there, all right? And I'm gonna take care of the food. You get to see the world on me, no rent, whatever, all right? 
And then in return for that, you're supposed to do some things for me. You're supposed to help me absorb nutrients from food. You are supposed to keep uh, things out of the bloodstream that shouldn't be getting in, help operate my immune system, and help operate my emotional and psychological system as well. And here's the problem, you guys. We have broken the contract big time, all right? They've lived up to their end of the bargain. We have eaten terrible food. We starved them out. But back to the, the intelligence of these creatures, we now know that they're smart enough that when you start eating bad food that starves out your good path of your, your uh, good bacteria, uh, or you take antibiotics and NSAIDs and drugs and all the things that people do, um, the, the bad bacteria, the pathogenic bacteria, reach across the aisle and say, hey, you guys over there are the good guys. Um, as you can see, you're starving. We're living off the fat of the land. So all you have to do is a little bit of genetic mutation. You can become one of us, all right? And you can live off the fat of the land too. So they actually genetically mutate in order to survive. And that's how your gut bacteria and your microbiome go downhill a lot, all right? So down there in the gut, you also have a separate nervous system. It's called the enteric nervous system, which is the second brain. And this is what's really interesting. All the feelings that you have, um, like anger, threat, fear, good things too, override the enteric nervous system from its real routine, which is supposed to be gastrointestinal function. And so that's in that way, dysbiosis and inflammation in the gut is linked to psychological issues, including anxiety and depression. So some of the functions that are affected when you're nervous all the time, and think about it, how many of you have experienced being upset about something and it, it manifests itself in some type of GI symptom, whether it's nausea, diarrhea, constipation, right? Um, we've all experienced it. So that's the, our, our emotions are very tied into our gastrointestinal tract. Okay, so things even get more interesting. The number of endocrine cells in the gut is more than the total of all other endocrine cells in the body. If you spread it all out, it's bigger than a basketball court. Signals are sent to the brain, things like fullness, nausea, discomfort, and then signals are sent from the brain. These are called gut responses. The gut responds to every emotion that humans feel, and we've always experienced this, and it's reflected on our language. You've heard things like gut-wrenching experience. Is everybody hearing that? Okay, butterflies in the stomach? or a gut instinct. I just have a gut instinct about this. There's really something to this, and it's based on the cataloging of a great deal of information that your microbes keep track of. So, while the psychiatry profession's been talking about serotonin levels in the brain, most of your serotonin is actually in the gut, 95% of it. And it helps to regulate certain physical functions like your gut, sleep, appetite, pain, sensitivity, and mood. And, mood. and it's produced by, the serotonin is produced by enteric hermaphin cells in the, in the uh, gut. So it functions as a hormone, but then it also functions as a neurotransmitter. Um, and by the way, SSRIs that are used to treat depression, it's one of the biggest side effects they have is gastrointestinal. People develop uh, diarrhea, cramping, all that sort of thing. So serotonin release affects emotions and feelings, and the movement of food through the system is what stimulates those cells to produce serotonin. That's why people feel happy after eating, okay? But there's another thing about it too. How many people have heard somebody say, since I've um, converted to this plant-based diet, I'm happier. My depression seems to have lifted. Anybody heard that? Well, here's the reason why. When you're a plant eater, you eat a high fiber diet, the food moves through the system quickly, right? The faster the, move, the food moves through the system, the more quickly you're gonna to have to eat again. That means that those cells are being stimulated more often than the people who eat a high fat diet, which slows the transit of food through the system. So these people aren't imagining it when they say, um, I feel so much better, my, side, my depression seems to have lifted since I started eating this diet. Okay, now I wanna go back to the intelligence of these microbes for a minute, because this is just, we, you, you cannot understand how important your microbiome is. So microbes, individual singular cell microbes, have the ability to do this. All right, there's a, top, there's a microbe called T. gondii, and it's a parasite that reproduces in the GI tract of infected cats. It can also infiltrate the brain of any mammal by crossing the blood-brain barrier, and it does it in rodents, and I'll tell you why. Infected cats expel this bacteria in their feces, and then they can't reproduce there. So rodents eat the feces of cats, and then once they do that, those bacteria migrate to the rodent's brain and hijack the part of the rodent's brain that would make them afraid of cats, and it makes them like to be around cats so that cats eat the rodents and the bacteria end up back where they want to be. Okay? So when people question me, because I've had psychiatrists write hateful letters saying, 
Are you telling me that the gut microbiome, the single cell bacteria can program a human being to think? I said, oh, absolutely. Single cell bacteria can program rodents to like to be around cats and ignore the fact that cats will eat them, all right? So don't discount those microbes down there. Remember, they used to live on their own before they took up residence in us. Now, some other evidence that we have. Um, Germ-free animals bred for research. Um, I don't like this type of thing, but I am going to report what it says because it's important. These animals have serious psychological problems. If you transplant fecal pellets from extrovert mouse, mice to introvert mice, the introverts become extroverts. If you transplant fecal pellets from obese mice to normal mice, they start overeating. And I'm not suggesting that you take probiotics and fix these problems. I'm suggesting that if you ignore this, you might have trouble fixing these problems. That's the issue. Um, the interaction between the brain and the gut and these microbes can promote good health or, or not good health, depending upon what you do. Um, I thought this was interesting. I found this in a medical journal. In 1933, psychiatrist Joseph Kilman wrote, I guess this was before they liked drugging everybody, it is far from our mind to conceive that all mental conditions have the same ideological factor, but we feel justified in recognizing the existence of cases of mental disorders which have as a basic ideological factor a toxic condition arising in the gastrointestinal tract. In 1933, I think I'm going to start my own medical journal called the Journal of Forgotten Research. Let's go get all this good stuff that we've known for 100 years and get it one place and start paying attention to it. And again, the negative um, changes uh, to the microbiome that are common in conditions like IBS and diabetes that, are co that commonly bring on depression um, all show changes in the gut. Now, when you take antibiotics, we all know you wipe out your gut microbiome, which is why you need to take probiotics. And we have still an epidemic of overprescribing. The dentists have gone off the rails. Their prescribing habits are 62% increased. And we all know that when you wipe out the gut bacteria, you're at higher risk of C. diff and MRSA. We're seeing C. diff and MRSA in community settings right now. You don't even have to go to the hospital to get those. But I started doing some research, and I was able to find a lot of studies showing that one of the side effects of antibiotics can be psychological issues. Um, an analysis of patient records shows that that's a common side effect. So uh, people who take antibiotics often will say, I've never been right since I took the antibiotic, my GI system doesn't work, and there's just something off about my whole life. And so again, um, anybody who's taken antibiotics, that may be part of what's influenced your depressive state. Um, now this I've included, one of the influences on the gut microbiome is diet, okay? And I thought this was worth quoting. The vegan gut profile appears to be unique in several characteristics, including a reduced abundance of pathobionts and a greater abundance of protective species. And then it goes on to talk about the superiority of the vegan microbiome. So this adds to what I already showed you, that plant eaters have a better chance of being mentally healthy the not plant eaters, and everybody who is suffering from some type of psychological disorder should be taught how to eat a plant-based diet and take probiotics, because that's a heck of a lot better than taking Zoloft and Xanax, all right? Yeah. And to the point, when you give um, mice who are anxious probiotics, it lowers their anxiety levels. I mean, really, the gut is a Xanax factory, people, if you feed it right, okay? Um, and then John Cryan, who's an Irish psychiatrist, did some studies with rats, and he found that, that um, the ability to resolve anxiety and depression in rats with probiotics was as effective as giving them Lexapro. If you go online and read the side effects of Lexapro, you, everybody would say, give me the probiotics. I'll try anything instead of trying that drug, which I'll have the rest of my life trying to get off of, right? Um, IBS patients, uh, who are notoriously depressed when you give them probiotics, their depression gets better. And a double-blind, placebo-controlled study showed that 30-day supplements with lactobacillus and bifidobacteria lowered psychological depress distress and depression, dis decreased anger and hostility. And I want you to take a look at the number of citations at the bottom of the slides. I mean, this wasn't like I went hunting and I found a couple of things here and there indicating that this was the case. I found a ton of stuff. Um, Low-grade inflammation and oxidative stress are associated with, with psychological distress and probiotics address both of those as well. A review of 10 studies um, concluded that probiotics are as effective in improving mood, anxiety, and cognitive symptoms, um, just as effective as drugging people. And again, much cheaper. I mean, most people 
for a fraction of the copay on the drugs that they're taking could eat optimally, like you're learning how to do here, and take probiotics, and um, we'll talk about exercise in just a second here as I finish up. Um, another uh, uh, study that was done on patients with chronic fatigue uh, syndrome, who often are very depressed, showed the same thing. Probiotics uh, result in the same, um, type, same type of improvement uh, that you would see with drugs. So, so far where we are, what you eat makes a difference, your gut microbiome makes a difference, your gut, mi your gut microbiome is influenced by what you eat, and sometimes need to be, needs to be restored if you've destroyed it enough with probiotics. So the third thing in this, whole, um, in this whole thing is exercise, which is the hardest thing to get people to do. And I understand that because I didn't used to like to exercise. I'm pretty athletic now, but I spent the first 20 years of my life sitting. Um, and my ability to avoid movement was so terrific at that time. I used to put my garbage cans on the hood of my car and drive them to the street. Because, <laughs> seriously. Because that was a way you could avoid moving around, which was my goal every day. And I used to say all the time, you know, I was getting fatter and fatter. And I said, I think I think I just have, like, my mother's fat. It must be my genes, right? Not the lack of movement or the food. But anyway, there's an incredible connection between exercise and mental health. And I subscribe to Runner's World because I'm a runner. And I do it for a lot of reasons, but the stories were so inspirational. People who suffered for dep from depression their whole life and started running and the depression lifted. People who were... Um, had ADHD, they were addicted to drugs or alcohol. And you see this all the time, people using running as a treatment plan. And I think that you take that money you're spending on the deductible for Lexapro or Xanax and go to the store and get some good running shoes, and it's a much better investment. You know? and, I, and running, one of the reasons I still run, I say you know, it's running and yoga are two of the reasons I got in the asylum. They're terrific for just calming you right on down, right? So. Research shows that the more inactive you are, the more likely you are to develop mental health issues. Okay, so Robert Brown and his group at the University of Virginia to uh, work with volunteer students who they volunteer to either exercise or opt out. And the active groups had reduced depression scores. And this is another one where the students who were the most depressed at the beginning had the most benefit from engaging in the exercise um, by the end of the study. Um, and then anger, fatigue, and anxiety released as, uh, were, were reduced as well. Um, another study, 30 community dwelling moderately depressed adults um, who were randomly si assigned to exercise social support and control. The exercise intervention, it wasn't even real aggressive. People sometimes think you gotta start running marathons, just start walking 20 minutes a few times a day and it, or a few times a week and it makes a difference. Um, and uh, depression was lifted. Participants randomized exercising on a cycle for 30 minutes, four times a week, or control. Um, exercise resulted in reduction of depression. Uh, 30 minutes of treadmill walking for just 10 days showed reduction in depression. Depressed adults who engaged in a 12-week training program versus controls. The training group had reduction in depression and anxiety. And again, um, not only could I find articles on this topic, I found about three dozen books that have been written, like whole books, three dozen different whole books. I bought them all, and I'm reading them because I have that research disorder. Um, I have another disorder. I, I do. I have another disorder. I have several disorders, by the way. But now that we have a mental health department, um, one of the favorite things of our mental health department is diagnosing me. So I've been diagnosed with attention deficit disorder because I do so many things. And uh, then they believe that I could qualify for a diagnosis of delusion um, and psychosis because I tell people I get everything I want because I always get everything I want. <laughs> right? And then we have the research disorder, you know. Um, so many, and then exercise disorder and compulsive book buying disorder. So we're, we're submitting those to the Psychiatry Association, the uh, compulsive research disorder and the book buying disorder for inclusion in the next DSM. And then Pfizer and all of the others can get together and come up with some kind of a drug to help people like me. Probably would take multiple drugs though to do something about people like me. But anyway, all right. So again, just you know, flying through these to give you an idea of the breadth of the information. Resistance training reduces depression. Uh, running and weightlifting both or alone reduce depression and anxiety. Um, this is interesting. I, I really want to talk, pay attention to this study because these adults were assigned to exercise medication or both for 16 weeks. Um, the medication worked more quickly, but at 16 weeks they were even. The exercise was working out just as well. 10 months of follow-up, the exercise group was much better than the medication group. 
And that's one of the limitations of the studies on the drugs. They're all short term. And other things work better if you follow it for a longer term. An analysis of 30 studies showed the most important factor in the efficacy of exercise for depression was the length of the program. Like the longer you do it, the better it gets. It's again that dose-dependent relationship. Effective equally for men and women, people of all ages, and including people who are severely depressed. Um, same thing, panic disorder, anxiety and panic disorder, exercise work. So, and then, I think it's the next slide, um, it even works for people who are hospitalized, people in mental institutions, and they never get any exercise. If you talk to anybody who's ever been confined uh, to a psych ward, they don't do anything with them. But in this study, 128 men who had psychosis and severe depression, they were heavily medicated, were put on an exercise program, and even under those circumstances, many of them got better, particularly the severely depressed men. Um, we see the same thing with exercise and addiction. Many times depression results from trying to withdraw from drugs ranging from opiates to heroin and that sort of thing. Um, exercise, this uh, one review showed that exercise can serve as an alternative to drugs and a way to prevent relapse. Um, just a couple more and then we'll start to tie this all together. Uh, one of the mechanisms is that when you exercise, your brain produces, it produces something called brain-derived neurotropic factor. So the more movement you do, the more of this stuff your brain manufactures, and the more connections are made in your brain. Okay, that's why people who run an exercise are so smart. That's why I'm so smart. <laughs> so, but, it, but not only does it, does it cause people to be able to retain cognitive function, it actually helps people repair damaged brains. And this could be important not only for the person who's trying to get off the of street drugs, but the person who is trying to get off the of psych drugs who has had severe damage to the brain. Put them on a treadmill, get them out running, get them in a yoga class. These are things that makes a big difference. You won't be shocked to hear this. Um, exercise can help with attention deficit disorder. Um, one of the reasons we have a problem, we have many reasons why this is a problem for kids, but one of them is they're just plain too sedentary. Um, and then all types of exercise will work. And by the way, when you look at the side effects of drugs used to treat ADHD, Compare that with the side effects of exercise, okay? You know, they're all good, all right? No negative side effects. And of course, those of you who are yogis like me, I have a yoga studio in my building, and it's right across the hall from my office, strategically placed. Another reason I'm not in the asylum. But uh, anyway, yoga has been found in many studies to be equally effective as antidepressant medication in helping people overcome anxiety and depression. And we've seen that in our own studio. I mean, we don't advertise yoga, as, as therapy, but it, but it is therapy. Um, and many, many people will say, um, and this is kind of funny, that their family members will even encourage them to go. And I know my staff encourages me to go. Sometimes I'll say, I don't know if I should go to yoga, and they're really busy. They all say the same thing. You go. You go. We got it covered. We'll be fine. You should go to yoga. And so, yeah. If you go regularly, instead of people complaining that it takes so much time and where have you been, they'll start saying, it's fine to go anytime you want. We're good. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so um, all of this leading to uh, when, when we made this agreement with Peter Bregan to be a business partner, the first thing he wanted to do was to come up with a program to help people get off the drugs. So we have a program, it's an 87 hour course offered through our school that teaches health professionals how to organize teams to get people off of their psychiatric drugs. Consumers take it too because they have an interest in this. And that, I'm showing you a tiny little snippet from this program. I started looking into this when we were writing the curriculum for this course. I said, if I can find enough information, I want to include it. And um, gosh, do I find enough information? So it got included in the course, but I teach this separately too. Um, so anyway, we basically cover helping people understand what really does cause depression, anxiety, psychosis, etc. cetera. Um, the effects of the drugs on the brain, the effect, how withdrawal can be done, um, understanding how careful you have to be. And um, one issue is medication intoxication. It's sort of like, have you ever been at a party where somebody's had too much to drink and you try to take the keys away and they say they're fine? Well, a lot of people think they're fine when they're withdrawing from psych drugs and they're really not, which is why you need a team. And um, so we use a collaborative approach. We're right now in the process of developing a program um, because we need more therapists, but. It's, it's difficult to train therapists, and so many of them, frankly, are not any better than cardiologists are at treating heart disease. So we're launching a program this fall called The Heart of Being Helpful, which will be people helping people to, in a community setting, 
to overcome their psychological issues. Um, we think, and our manifesto for this is that you don't need a license, nor do you need permission from the government to help people who are distressed. You need empathy, you need a few skills, you need a little bit of um, training, but we can all be helpful. We all are helpful to people. We just sometimes wish we could do more, and that's what this program would be about. So um, just a couple things, and I want to take some questions if we have time. You guys want to ask questions? Yeah. Okay, all right, so. All right, so the first thing is, to be crystal clear, we're not proposing that the real cause of biological mental illness is diet and gut microbiome and lack of exercise. We're saying that it's a contributing factor and it's difficult for people to get well mentally and psychologically if they don't address these issues. Um, studies clearly show that a plant-based eating pattern is better for resolving psychological issues. There's a relationship between the gut microbiome and mental health and your diet and the gut microbiome. Probiotics, therefore, should be part of treatment, and exercise is as effective for as drugs and um, no negative side effects. Um, well, a couple of things, other things I'll tell you, and we'll just open it up for questions. Um, I have a newsletter that I send out on Monday, and video clips on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Many of you are already subscribers, but that's free. We put out a ton of content that way. You can sign up at my table right outside the store, and that's where I'll go as soon as we're finished. I did bring books, happy to sign them for you. Um, you could try a free trial membership if you'd like to. I have those forms. We give you just a little bit of content so you can get your feet wet with the type of stuff we do. But uh, we have the largest database of informed decision making tools in the world. We have 3,500 hours of programming and 2,500 well referenced articles on topics ranging from kidney stones to uh, cancer treatment. So, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might like to ask. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, this presentation is available as part of a program. Um, so, so we we have and and how we help people by figuring out what it is that they want to know and then routing them through the same through the programs they want to take. And um, and for some people who want to learn a lot about a lot of this stuff, we offer diplomas through our school. And so you can take a little bit of program and a lot of programming, but we can talk to you about access to this at some point. Yes. How do you find a good uh, probiotic? A good probiotic, talk to, talk to somebody who is in practice. We have them in my office, um, and I don't really like having that stuff in my office, but the biggest issue is that we just don't have a product evaluation team. It's we, we, I don't think we ever will. So we get probiotics from a good company we trust. They do research on your products. And I tell people, I'll tell you the instructions for buying one, or you can get them from us, but I can't do product reviews for you, because people will call and say, I'm standing under the, you know, the aisle of the store, and, Tell me what you think of this. I don't have time for that. So buying them from people who uh, know something about them is the way to do it. So like a chiropractor? Well, if, if it's somebody you trust, yeah. If you okay. know the person knows what they're doing. What, okay. What's the brand name that you carry? Um, the brand name I carry is Sir Royal. It's it? Sir Royal, S-E-R-O-Y-A-L. There's a company in Canada that we like really well. And we've been with them for years, they do. They also have a, what, one important thing too, just so you know, most ninety percent of the studies, like what I'm showing you on the microbiome here, um, most of them have been published since two thousand and four. We were all out of school by then. So a good um, practitioner training program is is the best thing about a good probiotic company. They all understand that just putting these hands on the people, putting the products in the hands of people who don't know what they're doing, isn't going to be particularly helpful. So they have a very robust training program. Yes. What you do if somebody's having long-term withdrawal from, from um, uh, long-term consequences from withdrawal is we have to figure out what's going on. In other words, um, one, one of the things that I rant rave about a lot is the, the attempt to just get rid of all clinical judgment from working with people. So um, I, I 
don't like this idea that people are treated like um, machines. So you know how you've got an operations manual for your uh, for your your car. Okay, can can we not have background noise, please? Um, so anyway, um, you, you go to page 84 in the operations manual and this is what you do. So I can't really say, well, if the guy took Xanax and now he's off and he's having these problems, so let's go to page 64 in the operations manual and here's what you do. But um, the best thing for him to do is to get with somebody who knows something about this topic and, and can deal with helping him get on track. Um, benzodiazepine withdrawal is some of the worst withdrawal. It's harder to get off benzos than it is to get off heroin. I'd much rather see somebody withdraw from black tar heroin than from benzos. It's that much more difficult. So residual effects are common. So, other questions? Uh, yes? Uh, I'm sorry. You mentioned running many times. I, I heard that jogging isn't good for you because of shin splints and calming your whole weight. Actually, the is running, that... jogging is wonderful for you. And, and here's the thing. We even have studies showing, like at Stanford University, Head-to-head -head studies showing people who ran until they were 90 versus people who stopped running because they heard that, and the runners were much better off. If you have shin splints, something's wrong. You're either not wearing the right shoes, or you've got some type of alignment problem. It's fixable. Shin, shin splints is fixable. We have a muscular skeletal division too, so we can get rid of all those kinds of problems. But shin splints is not like something you're stuck with because you run. Because if that were true, humans could not have survived because we used to have to run from wild animals. You don't hear anybody. How could we have survived if, if running was not something we could do for our entire lifespan? So now you can run at any age if you choose to. If you choose to, yes. Is the the course this fall for the hard course for helping people? Yes. Well, that, we're going to introduce it at our conference, and then you'll be able to sign up for it. Um, and we're going to have a very unusual conference because we're going to give everybody a five hundred dollars certificate at the end toward the course that they want to take. Is it web based or? Is It'll be web based plus some live interaction too. Everything, everything we do is a combination of web, almost everything is a combination of web and live. We like that mixture of live. We think it's important. Thank you. you know. Yes, ma'am. You don't read them? Oh, <laughs> devastated. Well, the newsletter, the, the newsletter usually features an article, and then the video clips are video clips. It's like, you know, I, I comment on issues of the day. I, you know, when things come out, for example, big news a couple weeks ago, everybody's seen the New England Journal of Medicine retracted the Mediterranean diet study showing that olive oil and nuts are good for you, which I said in 1994 when it was published should be done, but you know, it takes a while for the world to catch up with me sometimes. Anyway, um, but, so, so that's what I cover on, on video clips. Um, so you just watch the videos. Now if you want if you want access to content, we're in the content business. I hate to tell you this, but we have to charge for it. And I'll tell you why. These people who work in my building, they have this thing about getting a check every Monday, and I cannot talk them out of it, I have tried. So we do have to charge you if you want access to content. But the video clips and the newsletter content are free. Yeah, and if you have trouble with it, call the office. But I'll tell you what, don't ever ask me a technical question because you'll wish you never contacted our company. Yeah, because I'm incompetent. We have to remember that. Yeah, one more question. One more question, and then I'll answer questions out there. Yeah, yes. Our grandson was diagnosed with epilepsy four years ago. He's 16 now. He's been on epilepsy meds. Do you think any of this would be able to help him? Because the epilepsy medicine helps him if his brain is yeah, I don't. I don't really know. This is another one of those where I can't answer. Clinic. I mean, you just don't know. I, it's, the the question is, a 16 year old who's epileptic on medication with this help, and I and I can't. I don't know. I just don't know enough to answer the question. Listen, thank you very much. I'm going to move out there. I'm happy to talk to you some more. <laughs>